contrary. Now, Zechariah did prophesy on something that's very relevant to where we are today. And let's, let's look at that. He did prophesy quite a bit about restoration, but in one, in, in one case, he prophesied boldly about restoration. And let's read about that. It has to do with the four horns and the four craftsmen. Let's talk about the four horns and the craftsmen. So, Zechariah chapter 1. Who would like to read 18 to 21 for us? Eighteen to twenty-one, Zechariah chapter one. And I lifted up my eyes and looked, and So I said to the angel who was speaking with me, What are these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. All right. Uh, to twenty-one. All right. So the four horns, who would the four horns be? What, what do we think about that? If we can look prophetically from the time of Zechariah, who would the four horns be? The nations. You know, what, what's the horn? The horn, we talked about the ten horns on the beast. The horns are kings or kingdoms, right? So he's seen four from his place in time, from his point in time. The four kingdoms or horns that were involved in the displacement of Israel were Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire, and then the final world empire, which is what we've seen today. So this relates to Daniel's vision of the four beasts that are the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the great and awesome beast. So these are the four horns, four kings, four kingdoms that will engage in scattering Israel. Now, let's talk about the craftsmen. Who do we think the craftsmen would be? If the horns are kingdoms, we'd figure that the craftsmen would be kingdoms as well, but they're not horns. They're crafts, craftsmen. So I want to propose to you that these are actual men actual man, that will get involved in the restoration of Israel that would terrify the beast. Yep. I've identified three of them. I'm not sure who the fourth will be. I don't have perfect prophetic insight, but I've identified four men, and they're all Jewish, who worked conjunctively <clears throat> in the mid-1800s to the beginning of the 1900s Four Jewish men of the diaspora that came from the diaspora that were very much involved with the restoration of Israel. Very much involved. And these are, I think, three of the men that terrified, terrified the horns. In fact, right around the time of these three men is when the world system determined that the restoration of Israel is in gear, and they had it to act quickly. They had to act quickly. So, so at the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s, we see a great push on the part of the globalist Babylon, a great push to establish their order and restrict and confine Israel. That was their agenda. Why? Because the evil one, the principality behind Babylon, noticed clearly that God had began his restoration process. The three men I'll mention to you tonight were, were certainly, certainly terrifiers of the world system. And the first one I'll talk to you about is Eliezer ben Yehuda. You've heard of Eliezer ben Yehuda? Who's Eliezer ben Yehuda? Who knows? Ah, he was the son of a rabbi, German who knew the Hebrew language very well, spoken in synagogues throughout 
the sin throughout the diaspora for millennia, the Hebrew language. Eliezer ben Yehuda, mid 1800s, mid to late 1800s, determined that the land of Israel is being restored. The Jewish people are returning to the land of Israel. What language should the Jewish people speak but Hebrew, their ancient language? And Eliezer ben Yehuda almost single handedly worked diligently to ensure that Hebrew would be the language of the fledgling state of Israel. And he succeeded. So Eliezer ben Yehuda, I, I determined to be one of the craftsmen. Again, all three craftsmen that I can recognize are Jewish. So his name is, I want to spell his name correct. Eliezer. Yeah. I think that's how you spell Yehuda, is it? Yehuda? I need a Y. Yeah. I have an H. Eliezer ben Yehuda. Excuse the Y. Why? Because it's my Y. So Eliezer ben Yehuda. He was responsible for what? Restoration of Hebrew. As the language of the fledgling state of Israel. Do research on him. Interesting. I read a book about Eliezer ben Yehuda. And, and he's, a, he's an incredible character. He was so determined. A very frail man, very small, sickly, very sickly. But God gave him all the strength he needed to, to press this issue forward. And this was a time when it was very unpopular to do anything in regards to the restoration of Israel. Within the Christian world at that time, within the Christian landscape, you had a strong pro-Israel movement very strong pro-Israel movement that really began as early as in the 1500s. And these pro-Israel, pro-Zionist Christians were called restorationists. And Eliezer ben Yehuda received a lot of help and support and encouragement from those Christians who were restorationists. Because they were believing that the time had come to restore Israel, that Israel needed to be restored. And Ben Yehuda was working very diligently at this. So you go to Israel, there, there's Ben Yehuda Street, right? Uh, ben Yehuda is a, a great hero in Israel today because of what he did. Let's talk about another great hero that I consider to be one of the craftsmen. Theodore Herzl. What do we know about Theodor Herzl? He's referred to as the, the father of the modern Zionist movement. And to, a, to an extent he is. He, he, did, he did more for the modern Zionist movement than, than many at that time. But he's recognized as the father of the modern Zionist movement. The, Theodor Herzl was not a believer. Neither was Eliezer ben Yehuda necessarily. But they were Jewish. They grew up in a Jewish community, in Jewish homes. And they were very focused on Israel, the importance of Zion. Theodor Herzl was one of these people. Now, if one of you guys can do a quick research for me, Theodor Herzl was mentored or encouraged greatly by a pastor, a German pastor. Well, this pastor was, you have his name? Hemley, yeah. Hemley, yeah. This German pastor was one of these restorationists of the 1800s. Very strong, pro-Israel, pro-restoration pastor from Germany. Now, Theodor Herzl, Theodor Herzl was not a believer in Messiah that we, as far as we know. He was barely a man of faith in regards to Israel. But God used him powerfully. These craftsmen are not necessarily believers like we would reckon them to be believers. Okay, now the next, the next 
craftsman I, I am going to project for you was more of a believer than these two. But Theodore Herzl was, he was, he was a dogged Zionist. He was, he was committed to the restoration of Zion. And, and his efforts, his work, it largely is responsible for the establishment of the Jewish state and the bolstering of the Jewish state. God used him. Theodore Herzl has a testimony, even though he's not a believer. He has a testimony. And his testimony was uh, at a very dark time in his life, when he was at the verge of giving up his mission, the Messiah appeared to him. This is his testimony. Now, he didn't identify the Messiah as Jesus. He just said the Messiah appeared to him in his sleep, while he was asleep, and told him that, that he, is, he is ordained or set apart to do a good work concerning Israel. Now, no doubt, this Christian pastor, whatever his name was, what was his name? I think you're right. Wilhelm Hen Henley. Sounds correct. He was German, so you say Wilhelm. Wilhelm Henley. Henley. All right. I need to keep his name in, in, in my data bank because I, I speak about him from time to time. So you can research this guy and, and understand what the, 18, the 1800 or the, the 1900, uh, the 19th century Restoration Christians, what they were thinking and what they were doing, how active they were. We think of our, ourselves, Christians today, who are Zionists, as being very active relative to Israel. The truth is we're less active today than we were in the 1700s and the 1800s. We're much less active today, which is a shame, but we were accomplishing more in the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s relative to the restoration of Israel. Yes? Heckler. Heckler, all right. Uh, all right, so William Heckler, look him up. He was a great encouragement to Theodore Herzl. No doubt William Heckler was interceding for Theodore Herzl. And Theodore Herzl has this incredible testimony. And he was not a believer. He wasn't even a spiritual man. And he testified that the Messiah appeared to him and affirmed his commission to, to building up the land of Israel. I consider Theodore Herzl to be a craftsman who has terrified and, in a sense, still terrifies the four horns. These two men are still... <laughs> terrifying these four horns, aren't they? The last one is an interesting character by the name of Sir Benjamin, who knows? Disraeli. What do you know about Benjamin Disraeli? Correct. He was, during the Victorian period of the British Empire, he was two terms prime minister, beloved by the British people, very conservative. You know, uh, Britain was always divided between the, 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 the Labour Party and the conservatives, right? The conservatives were considered to be the intellectuals, uh, whereas the, the, uh, the Labour Party are considered to be the blue-collar people and so on. Nevertheless, Disraeli was a Jew. He was an unabashed Jew who became Prime Minister of the Great British Empire twice, two terms. And he would defend his Zionist, uh, his Zionist aspirations vehemently in the British Parliament, win many debates against the, his, oppo his opposition, his opposers concerning Israel. Israeli Benjamin, Israeli, Sir Benjamin Israeli, is very much responsible for what ultimately became the Balfour Declaration. You've heard of the Balfour Declaration? Certain aspects of the Balfour Declaration wasn't exactly good. But what did the Balfour Declaration do? Committed Britain to statehood. And that happened in the 1920s, somewhere there. Well, Disraeli, Benjamin Disraeli, was very much involved in the early push towards allowing Israel to be its own state. Very much involved in it. I have a couple of quotes here from Disraeli that, he, that he, 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 he used in certain debates in parliament. If you know anything about parliament, the British parliament, is when someone stands before the parliament, he can, he can receive uh, 
uh, confrontation. He can be confronted openly by, by people who oppose him, right? So the British Parliament can be like a pub. All that's missing is the Guinness. It, it, they don't get off in, in fights and so on, but not as, not as much as in some other places. But, but they're very confrontational in Parliament. Right? And so here, is, here are a couple of quotes by the Israeli. Um, someone confronted him in the House of Commons, and he responded, While your ancestors were painting themselves blue, my ancestors were worshipping one God. <laughs> and and from, from what I read about that quote, he really shut down his opposer. Uh, because, because he was being challenged as a Jew, and he comes back with this response. Now, the response was so intelligent because what did he mean by they were painting themselves blue? Well, the pagans, not only in Great Britain, not only the, the Anglo-Saxons and the Nordic peoples, the Celtics, uh, pagans from throughout the world paint, paint themselves blue. In my little island, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, we have carnival. You know what carnival is? Carnival, carnival, carnival. Carnival is Mardi Gras, same, same Catholic celebration, right? Uh, two days before the beginning of Lent, the Catholics would have a, a release of inhibition, and they would drink all the grog and behave badly, and then comes a month of Lent. In fact, we're in the month of Lent right now. So Carnival is really big in Trinidad, really big. It's second to Rio de Janeiro surpasses um, New Orleans by far. Carnival is a big deal down there. In fact, the whole island exists for Carnival. I was a part of that. Now, at the beginning of Carnival Monday, it's called Juve, and Juve is when you, you, you dress yourself as a demon, literally as a demon, and you get out in the streets and you just revel. All sorts of stuff. Debauchery, you drink, you just, eh, just, just, Revelry. It's paganism, right? So we, we painted ourselves blue. Yeah. I did. We all did. We painted ourselves blue. In fact, you can see that even in, in, in European pagan countries today. At the beginning of Carnival, Monday morning, early Monday morning, Sunday night, people would paint themselves blue and get out in the streets, get drunk, get crazy, repent on Wednesday morning. Now, why? Why blue? And even the Hindus, the Hindus engage in this. Why blue? Because, and this is, this is a little bit out there, but it's real. It's real because we're still doing it. The pagans are still painting themselves blue. There was a belief in ancient paganism that goes all the way back to the pre-flood civilization that some of the demons, the leading demons, were blue in, in color. So if you, if you were to get into Hinduism, to, to research into Hinduism, their major gods, Vishnu, Krishna, they emanated blue skin. And so it's, it's sort of a pagan culture, pagan tradition, that those who practice paganism would paint themselves blue and get on really badly. The Celtics did it at certain times of the year. The British did it at certain times of the year. In fact, it was just around the same time of the year. So when, when Disraeli made that statement, he, he struck at the core of pagan Europe. And he said, while you were blue, dancing like demons in the streets, we were worshiping one God in the land of Israel. And he shut down his, 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 the person who confronted him, his detractor, real quickly with that statement. Now, he, was, he was a powerful guy. He would speak powerfully. The queen, who was, who was the queen at that time? Victoria. Victoria. Victorian age. Uh, she, she marveled at his quick responses and how wise he was, how intelligent he was. Let me read another quote from the Israeli. This is in 18, 1835. A Catholic priest by the name of Daniel O'Connell confronted him about his Jewish his Jewishness. <laughs> and so here is how the Israeli responded. He said, yes, I am a Jew. And while the ancestors of the right honorable gentlemen were brutal savages 
in an unknown island, mine were priests in the temple of Solomon. <laughs> so this rally was powerful. And he, many quotes like that, just over and over. You can get all his quotes off the internet. So. Ah. So Disraeli, uh, Benjamin Disraeli is not considered much in the Jewish community, right? He's not considered to be a Jewish hero as much. But they cannot deny the fact that he did more for the state of Israel than any other uh, Israeli to that time. Uh, Disraeli, uh, Benjamin Disraeli was instrumental, pivotal, but he was a believer. He was a believer, but he defended Israel vehemently. Before the House of Commons, with, 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 with real force, he defended Israel. Never turned his back on the Jewish people. So you were writing something about this, really? That's a very controversial yes. subject yes. in the Jewish community. It's controversial for, for many reasons. You've got 400 years of inquisition, forced conversions, and the whole debate about the people being forced to convert, whether they, they are Jewish or not. That, that's a long-standing debate. So I descended from the, from the Beni Anusim. I descended from the, the people who were forcibly converted. It's, it's, a, it's a volatile subject, and some people get really passionate about it. I was passionate at one time, but I left it alone because it's not really my fight. I'm not looking to be accepted as a Jew because I'm not. I'm not a Jew. I descended from the forcibly converted Jews. So if, if I were looking to convert to Judaism, then it would be a huge issue for me because I would struggle to say, I am a convert, but my blood is Jewish, and I can prove it. So that, that lends itself to, to a lot of uh, possible strife and, and debate, and the debate is still going on today, but uh, Israel, Israel and the rabbinate, the, 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 the rabbis of the world, are very concerned about this, because you have, particularly today, many Hispanics, that are identifying their, their Jewish ancestry, and just because of the identity of being historically Jewish, they are wanting to become Jews without, without the proper motivation. So the rabbinate are saying, no, I'm sorry, uh, we can't function like this. And I agree with them. I agree with them. Uh, many of these Bene Anusim, as they refer to, the sons of the coerced, uh, actually Christians who are just wanting to be Jewish. Sort of a pride thing. That, I have no place for that. I have no respect for it. Either you're a Jew, convert, embrace Judaism, or you're a Christian. 
don't try to straddle the fence on that issue. And that's a huge, huge thing. But Disraeli never, uh, never wavered in that regard. He was a Christian, but he was perhaps the greatest restorationist ever. Ever. I mean, Christian restorationist. If, if you say to me, indicate, illustrate, or point out who would be the greatest Christian restorationist of all time, I would say Benjamin Israeli. For sure. Because he never wavered, and he was instrumental in what would become the Balfour Declaration, the State of Israel. You can read some of his quotes. I can give you this. Uh, he was committed to the, the establishment of the State of Israel, and he was a Christian. He so, was also committed to the empire of Britain oh yeah. being you know, literally the world's greatest empire uh, since, since the Mongol Empire. But how would that fit in to that same world view? In other words, uh, he wanted Britain to be the, the absolute empire authority, final, final empire. Yeah, ultimately, and, and he was a Zionist, and he understood, the, the, as a Christian now, as a believer in the Bible, he understood the implications of future Zionism, that ultimately God's kingdom would be established in Zion. But he was a, a colonialist. He was a colonialist in that sense. He was, you know, prime minister of, Israel, of uh, Great Britain while they were at the apex of their colonizing of the world. So... Yeah, so I, I, I think Disraeli was conflicted. I've, I've, there are books on Disraeli that you can read and, and get to know his mind a little bit. But he was conflicted somewhat, like, like Christopher Columbus and many of the other pioneers that, you know, Christopher Columbus, he was forcibly converted as a child, outwardly Christian, but inwardly he still held on to his Jewish ancestry. So Christopher Columbus also, even before the Restorationist uh, period, was in sense, in a sense, a Restorationist. If you read the writings of Christopher Columbus, and he wrote quite a bit, you can get his, uh, his writings, his journals off the internet, and I've looked at some of it. The guy was a Christian, but he was an incredible Zionist. He kept referring to the Restoration of Israel. Over and over in his writings, he kept referring to the time when Israel would be restored, Jerusalem would become that city. Christopher Columbus. Part of his mission was to discover the ten lost tribes. That, that was one of his missions. And again, if you look at his writings, there are cryptic indicators in his writings. Cryptic notes, little, little signals and, 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 and signs that he would put on his writing to illustrate his Jewishness. It's all over his writings. So Columbus was, in fact, on his fifth journey back to Spain, they arrested him. You know why they arrested him? You need to look it up. They arrested him because they suspected that he was Judaizing. Which he was. <laughs> he was. And he was a powerful man in Europe, and so they let him go, and he continued. So Columbus was a Jew who looked for the restoration of Israel. Now, Columbus functioned that way long before this really, but it's the same reality. So, so I, can, I, I can say, well, maybe Columbus should be up on the board, but I don't think he should. Absolutely. This subject we'll talk about more in depth, in depthly as we go along. In fact, we'll have a full class on this subject. But absolutely, he did. Absolutely, Columbus did. His name was what? Who knows what Columbus's Portuguese name was? Research it. Columbus's Portuguese name: Salvador Fernandes Zaco. Sometimes it's represented as. Uh, Salvador Zaco Fernandez. I think the correct, his correct name is Salvador 
Fernandez Zarco. But doesn't Salvador mean savior? Yeah. Well, he was, he was a Christian, but oh, he was not born a Christian. As a child, he was converted. Yeah. Yeah, but no, 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 I'm sorry, not, not the Mamluks, the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire. Certainly during Columbus, the Mamluks were in possession of, uh, of, of, of Jerusalem. So, so from the perspective of Columbus and all of the other navigators, the Jewish navigators like, like Zakuto, a um, uh, bunch of them, Bartolomeu Diaz, another Jewish navigator, Portuguese, um, Vasco de Gama. And, yeah, of course he was. All of these crypto Jewish navigators, they lived during the time of the Mamluk Empire when you couldn't even dare approach Jerusalem as a Jew. You couldn't because the Mamluks would kill you. The Mamluks were horribly anti Jew and anti Israel. But in 1517, what happened? The Reformation. Well, that's important, but what else happened? Um, yes. The Ottoman Empire came into existence. A, a sultan by the name of Suleiman, and in fact, I would put Suleiman up on the board, quite frankly. I would put Suleiman up on the board as one of the craftsmen. Because he unwittingly, without very much of his own effort, became a craftsman that was very much involved in the building up of the land of Israel. I will put another person up there and you'll have to research this yourself. Now, there are many craftsmen. I'm not saying that there's only four. Zachariah identified four craftsmen. Maybe the three that I have up on the board are three of the four, I don't know. But there are many craftsmen, many people who have been responsible in some dimension for the restoration of the land of Israel that has terrified terrified the four horns. And the four horns are still terrified. In fact, the four horns that has become the beast with ten horns are perpetually terrified. They live in a state of, con of consistent terror. So, now, the Ottoman Empire came into existence in 1517. What happened? Well, they defeated the Mamluks and it was brutal. <laughs> the Ottomans were brutal. And, and horribly defeated the, the Mamluks. And what did the Ottomans do? They opened the door for Jewish migration into the land of Israel. Solomon was very much involved in that. That's why I said I would quickly put Solomon up there, but not Solomon, the person that inspired him. <coughs> and the craftsman is actually a craftswoman. Dona Garcia Mendez, she is certainly a craftswoman in this regard. Now, that's my opinion. She may not be one of the four. The Israeli may not be one of the four that God referred to in Zechariah. Theodore Herzl already is uh, Ben Yehuda. But Dona Garcia Mendez, pivotal in the restoration of the state of Israel because it was Dona Garcia Mendez a Portuguese who she was born on the island of Madeira, the same island that Christopher Columbus came from. He was, she was born on the island of Madeira. Her name was Garcia, which was a very important Jewish name on the island of Madeira. And she married Mendez. Mendez was an incredibly rich uh, Portuguese Jew. He died, sickness, I think he died early, and she inherited an incredible fortune. But then came the forced conversions of Portugal, Madeira, Portugal. By the time she had married Mendez, she had moved from Madeira, and she lived in Lisbon, Portugal. Very, very rich, powerful uh, Jewish family in Lisbon, Portugal. But then the forced conversions came into existence, and she had to leave, and she left. She refused to be converted. But what she did, because of her incredible import and wisdom, and, and, and just, just acrimony, she managed to get mostly all of her fortune out of Portugal to Holland. 
She got all of her wealth out, successfully got it out from, from Lisbon and was, was sent to Holland. From Holland, though, she was determined that she would have a part in the building up of the land of Israel. She was a Zionist. She was a Christian forcibly converted, but in her heart, she was a daughter of Abraham and continued to be a daughter of Abraham. But outwardly, she was a Christian. She was what's referred to as a Maranos. So from, from Holland, Amsterdam, she began to do business with Solomon. She began to petition the great Solomon, the, the Ottoman Empire emperor, for opportunities to invest into the land of Israel, to send funds into the land of Israel. And she succeeded. Her business acumen was incredible. She wasn't just a wealthy widow of a very successful Portuguese businessman. She herself was very, very, uh, very prolific. And she succeeded because it was Dona Garcia Mendez that was almost single-handedly responsible in the early 1500s for the building up of the land, financing the building up of the land of Israel. The city of Safed, or Sped, northern Galilee, in the Galilee, she poured tons of her resources into the building up of Sped. You can go to Tiberias today on the Galilee, and there's a hotel there with a museum, which is the Dona Garcia Mendez Museum. And in that museum, the next time we go, we're going, right? The next time we go to Israel, we're going to that museum. And you can go to the museum and learn all about Dona Garcia Mendez. Again, in some Jewish sources, Dona Garcia Mendez is not really regarded as a Jewish hero or heroine. Why? Because she was a Christian, forcibly converted, but never ever embraced Christianity. She was always a crypto Jew. And so that's why some of Israel or some of the Jewish uh, uh, people, some of the Jewish uh, uh, writers and so on, would consider her because she did resist. She died as a Jew. She never fully converted. So, but what, what was the importance of Dona Garcia Mendez? Well, her import is outstanding because she was one of the early, in, in fact, in fact, who has, a, who has a, 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 a Bible like I do, which is the, the New International Inductive Study Bible? Who has one of these? Nobody does. No? So if you go to the back of that Bible, they provide a lot of insight, historical information, and so on in the back of that Bible. So, in the back of that Bible, if I can find it here real quickly, it mentions the restoration of Jerusalem, the process by which Jerusalem was restored. And if I can find it, I'll do well. Uh, 70 AD, I'm way back in 70 AD at this point. Anyway, in this Bible, they provide a very concise couple of paragraphs about about the same subject. It's in here. Mm. Oh, I'm back in the... Okay, I'll find it here now. Uh, destruction of Jerusalem, the Mamluk period, the Ottoman period. So, I have here about two paragraphs dealing with this very subject. And in, this, in, this, in these two paragraphs, you can see it. Can you find it? It's on page... 2097, 96 and 97. Now, this is just a, a short excerpt from the historical narrative as to how the restoration of the Jerusalem and Sfed, Tiberias, and even Hebron occurred. It was, after the, it was during the Ottoman Empire, after the, after the Sultan Solomon took possession of the land of Israel in 1517, same time with the Reformation, not a coincidence. And from that period on, because of Solomon, it says it there in that, those two paragraphs, but if you do a conventional historic research on this subject, they will say it was because of Solomon that Jewish life returned to Jerusalem. Scholastic centers were built, synagogues popped up everywhere. In fact, if you've been to Jerusalem, you guys were there with me last year, 
You went, you, you went past, you walked past the Ahuva Synagogue in the square right there in Jerusalem. The Ahuva Synagogue was built with money financed by Dona Garcia Mendez. Yes. If you, look at, if you look into the history, she was one of the people who poured tons of monies into the building up of Jerusalem, Hebron, Fed, and Tiberias. So this woman, who literally ran for her life from the Spanish Inquisition, the Portuguese Inquisition, for forcibly conversion, this woman became a craftsman, terrorizing the very horns that sought to oppress, divide, and destroy Israel. I have four of them up on the board. There are many, many more. Many, many more. And many of them are, are genuine Christians like Disraeli. Now, Donna Garcia Mendez, she was not a genuine Christian. She never received a witness of what it is to be a genuine Christian. All right? she, she was born on the island of Madeira in the late 1500s. Come from a powerful Jewish family. Sugarcane was their industry. They were powerful. But then she married someone who was even more powerful, Mendez, who was involved in, uh, and he, was a mar he was a sailor. He, he had ships. More powerful, more money. She had to flee because she didn't want to be forcibly converted to be a Catholic. Not a Christian, a Catholic. Because that was the witness of what a Christian was that she received. Horrible. Now, this rarely received a different witness. One that he could have embraced in the 1800s. So I say the horns, you have four of them here. There are many, many more. In fact, you are a horn. You represent a body of people, Fellowship Church. You are quite literally a horn that does, in fact, ter not a horn. Let me strike all those statements. You're not a horn. These people are not horns. They're craftsmen and a craftswoman, one of them. You are craftspeople. You are craftspeople. In fact, you are a craftsman. You're one in Messiah. You're one body of people in Christ. You're a craftsman. Do I need to, ex to, to expound on that? No, because you have been building up in the land of Israel for decades. You just sent 20,000 to the work at Gan Aragut in Male Amos. It's only $20,000. It's nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. But a lot of that has to do with encouraging those two rabbis and their families to build, 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 move forward. We will send you what we have. We don't have much, but what we have, we'll send you. Keep building, keep building, keep building. We literally go to Kedumim every year and we put our hands in the soil. We build walls. We build uh, places where they can be at peace, a park. We're building, we're building, we're building. All right, so we didn't get to build a, a community, a, a, a subdivision, a, what we call a subdivision. We didn't get to build houses. But what we did get to build in Samaria, in the Shomron, is a place where they can go and enjoy their Shabbats, a place where they can go. In fact, they, they were there today, enjoying the park today. Today was a big day for them at the park. So what, do you, what, what did we build? We build a place where they can experience peace, a place of serenity. That's powerful. You're builders. You're, you're craftsmen. I tell you, uh, we, have, we have a couple of uh, people that, that's involved with our mission there. One of them is Boaz. Now, Boaz, he is, did, you, did we meet Boaz when we were there? We didn't meet Boaz. Mm -hmm. No, no, you, that's Shlomo. Boaz was there. Boaz was there, but his personality is that he would not show up and he would kind of stay in the back. Boaz is, in that community, what you call a zadika, a righteous, righteous man. He's a zadika. Everyone considers him to be a zadika. Very connected to the land of Israel. He, he's intelligent, he's educated, but he just wants to work in the land. So he's the community's gardener. That's what he does. The guy's hands, <laughs> knobby, he's a small guy, knobby and, and large and, and like sand people. I mean, this guy is a man of the field, quintessential man of the field. 
walking, walking out there every day. And he does it with, with a righteous perspective that the land of Israel needs to be rebuilt. And that's what he's doing. And this is Boaz. Boaz was the one who had the vision initially about the park. A place where the community can come out, enjoy Shabbats, enjoy picnics, and be at peace. It was diffi it's difficult to live in, in Israel. And so providing a place where they can have a sense of coming to tombs with, with God and having a time of prayer together was a big thing for Boaz. It was his vision. And he shared that vision with Daniela Weiss. And Daniela Weiss came to us about that back in the early 2000s. She said, we have a gardener in Kedumim. His name is Boaz, and he's a Zadika, and he is committed to do something with this project. I can't get him off my back. He's always pestering me about this. Uh, maybe you can do something to help him. <laughs> and so <laughs> she was right. We got involved with the project, and we've been going over there since 2007 to work in this project, two weeks at a time, a week at a time in some cases. We've been working very hard. We put a lot of love, a lot of devotion into that, into that project. We, we, listen, the project is not just going there and working for two weeks. Raising the funds was the real nature of the project. And we worked very, very hard over the years to make that a reality. And every time we did it, every time we went, we were craftsmen. Terrorizing the horns. Terrorizing the horns. Because we were providing... The, the, the love and the faith and the passion and the little funds that we had to build for them a place where they can experience God. Boaz, one time we went, 2015, <laughs> 2015, no, no, 2010, excuse me, 2010. Lisa and I, it was our anniversary, we were, gonna, we were going to, uh, to, to redo our vows at the park, and we did, 2010. And right after we, we, we redid our vows, John Klein came out and he did that with us. Right after it happened, the, the park was miserable that year. It was hot. It was like desert heat coming over the park. It was terrible. And there were only 12 of us. The work was hard. We spent two weeks out there. We didn't tour. We just went to the park for two weeks and worked. 12 of us. It was tough. And so we renewed our vows in, at, at noon, in the morning, it was miserable. But then, right after that lunch time, a wind, a cool wind just came down from, from the valley and swept across the park. It almost as if it pushed the hot, horrible air out. And then it became windy and cool. It was wonderful. And as I'm standing there ex experiencing this change in the weather, I look up on the mountain and I saw Boaz with his talit. And he's facing Jerusalem from the top of the mountain at the park, and he's, he's Davidin as he's praying. And I said, wow, look, look, at, look at that. That's amazing. Here is a descendant of Abraham standing on this piece of land that Abraham, right across the valley, offered up sacrifices to God on behalf of Shechem. And here he is, all these millennia later, 4,000 years later, and he's standing here by faith, believing that, that this is God's work. And he's standing there at the park, and he's praying. And as, as, as I walked away from that, I looked away from him, the word of God quickened in me, and I had something like a vision, not a vision, but something like a vision quickened to me, and it was that houses will flow from this park all the way over the hill and into Shechem. Jewish houses. Restoration. So what, what, what the Holy Spirit quickened me as I'm standing there looking at Boaz at this incredible event was that the restoration is still going. And the houses will be built from this park headed eastward towards Shechem. You know what's happening there now? Guess what's happening there now? Houses are being built, pointing towards Shechem. The community is expanding, and it's going to happen. So Shlomo, a few years ago, when they broke ground for that housing project that will go from the park in the direction of Shechem, 
Shlomo was angry. Boaz was angry. Avi was, no, it shouldn't happen. They're going to spoil the area. This is a, this is a nature park. We have animals, antelopes, and, and, and so on that comes through here. These houses are going to ruin things. And I listened to Shlomo, and I said, mm, 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 do I really want to argue with Shlomo? <laughs> ah. So the first time I heard it, it was on a phone call from here. And I had, I had a response for him, but I didn't tell him. So I'm there now in his face, and he tells me this thing. He's mad. He's angry. We're all upset. This should never be. He's mad at, at Hananel, the mayor, for doing this. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So I had, to, I had to approach the argument tactfully, right? So I said, you know, Shlomo, in Florida, every time I see a subdivision go up, I get angry. Because it means that trees are going to be knocked down, animal life are going to be denied, and I, I, I get angry every time I see it. But you know what, Shlomo? That works in the diaspora. It cannot work here. Because this is about the rebuilding of the land of Israel. So being upset about houses going up is, is for the goyim, for the nations. It's not for you. And he was like, he was, he was taken back by it. And of course he went about and he told them, he told all of them what I said. And uh, yeah, Avi came up to me several times and he re reminded me of what I said to Shlomo. And the perspective for them now is, yep, yeah, we don't like it, but you know what? It's the restoration of Israel. It's being built up. Houses are coming. Communities are being built up, Jewish communities. So it's actually a good thing, right? So, so you are craftsmen. Literally, you are craftsmen. Yes, absolutely. So four craftsmen, it could be 400,000 craftsmen. Right? And so we're here to challenge and to... To, to frighten, to terrorize the horns, and we are. I told it, I gave the testimony yesterday about what happened in 2015. Well, you, we terrorized that horn. We did. The horn didn't even recognize us. Didn't even know that there was a tenacious bunch of Christians there who were craftsmen. Didn't even know it. Didn't know what hit them. <laughs> but they got hit pretty hard, unexpectedly, just completely undergirded. So the restoration of Israel, the four horsemen, now the four horns, excuse me, four horsemen is a different book. The four craftsmen, very important, right? So you can see how these three Jewish people, in fact, four Jewish people, Dona Garcia Mendez, I consider Sir Benjamin Israeli to be Jewish, but also Christian. Now, had he converted to, Jude to Christianity and turned his back on Israel, I would have said, no, he's not Jewish. But the, the man was committedly pro-Israel. So think about that statement. If you are a Christian, but you are committedly pro-Israel, you're Jewish, even if you have no Jewish blood, right? And that's what it is to be a wild, a wild branch grafted into the rich olive tree. You have the same purpose, you're different, but you have the same purpose, the same orientation. And your heart, your, your passion is in the same place. So the restoration of Israel, very, very critical in regards to where we are today. Any questions? All right. All right, so let's talk about the glorification of Zion. Oh, by the way, we're going to talk about the, the, uh, the reality of who Columbus was and that whole thing. We're going to talk about that at length in about four classes. Yes? Was that the part that they had Yeah. Yep. All right, so let's talk about the glorification of Zion. Haggai spoke of the glory of the temple, of the latter temple being better or greater than the glory of the first. So what temple was he referring to as the first? 
Solomon's temple. He said, the glory of the latter temple will be greater than the glory of the first temple. Haggai prophesied while they were rebuilding the second temple. So clearly, perhaps, in Haggai's mind, the second temple would surpass the first temple. You follow me? Haggai perhaps believed that ultimately the glory of God would fill that second temple and it would be greater than the first. But he was wrong. He was right in his prophecy, but perhaps if he did in fact think of the second temple being that temple, he was incorrect. The latter temple is the third temple. You can go beyond that and say the new Jerusalem, of course, but the latter temple, the third temple, not the second temple, because the second temple, even though it was built ultimately by Herod, much more grandiose, much more refined, and simply better than Solomon's temple, it never surpassed in glory. Why? Because the glory of God did not occupy that temple at all. Haggai's prophecy is, is real. It's applicable to the third temple. Why the third temple? Someone tell me, why, the th why, why would the glory of the third temple surpass the glory of Solomon's temple? Who? The glory of God. Yeshua and the church. Each of us, myriads and myriads of us, glorified, shining bodies, literal glory filled in us, will return, and that will be the temple. We will be the temple. So, of course, Haggai saw that the latter temple will be much more glory filled than the first temple. And that's a true prophecy. So read that for us in Haggai chapter 2, verse 9. Someone? Haggai chapter 2, verse 9. Thank you. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And in this place I will make peace. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. Mm -hmm. A definite, a, de a definite statement, a definitive statement, I should say. He proclaims his sovereignty. I, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of angel armies, have spoken. In other words, it's going to happen. It's, it's a done deal. The latter temple will be, will be much greater in his glory than the first temple. All right. Zechariah now saw that God would dwell in that temple in Zion that God himself would dwell there. So someone read Zechariah chapter 2, verse 4 to 5 for us. <clears throat> Zechariah 2, 4 and 5. Mm. Now, the word glory there is not referring to glory in the sense that you have a football player who makes a good pass and he receives glory for it. No, the word glory there is kavod. It's, it's referring to a literal force, a tangible force that will, like, that will fill uh, Jerusalem. <clears throat> the glory of God will be Jerusalem, a, f a wall of fire around Jerusalem. So clearly he's referring to the time when we will be there. We will be that wall of fire. We will be that canopy of glory that Isaiah referred to and that Zechariah is referring to here. And God will dwell in that place. Again, chapter 2, 10 to 12 for us. 10 and 12. Zechariah chapter 2, 10 to 12. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I am in your midst, mm -hmm. says the Lord. Amen. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people, and I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts, 
has sent me to you. Amen. And the Lord will take possession of Judah and his inheritance in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Amen. God is dwelling there. They will be his people and I will be their God. Whenever you find that statement, yes. it's always referring to that time when Israel is restored and God is in their midst. Every time you see it. That statement is made dozens of times. Even in the book of Revelation, it's made twice. So, it's referring to that time when God's glory will exist in the midst of uh, Jerusalem, Zion. Chapter 8, verse 3, anyone? Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. Ir ha emet, the city of truth. So this, this is what we have on the board here. This is what we have on the banner next door. Uh, the, the banner with the, with, the, with the menorah on it. Uh, that verse is right there on the banner, and, and that is because when I chose that verse for the banner, because the menorah is such a wonderful representation of God's glory and who Jesus is, who we are, and who we will ultimately be. Why, why would I say such a thing? Jesus said, I am the light of the world, referring to the menorah in the tabernacle, in the temple, but he also said that you uh, the light of this world. No one lights a candle and puts it under a basket, but puts it on a stand for all to see. So we would be lit on the day of the resurrection. We would be lit brightly. And God's going to put us on a stand for all to see. It's coming. So let's take a break. We'll come back at quarter after nine and we'll continue. Now, it's okay to say, okay, so the nations will grab a hold of the zitzis of a Jew and, and say, that's okay, that's fine. But it's, it's sort of a, it's just not correct. Not every Jew is going to wear a zitzi. What about a Jewish woman? She doesn't wear a zitzi. So it applies to women as well, right? Not every Jew wears the zitzis externally. Some would wear it internally. So I, I, I just don't really have much... Uh, much desire to twist the word of God. Even though it's a good thing, you're twisting it. So just keep it as a fringe, the fringe of your garment. If Zachariah meant zitzi, he would have said zitzis. <laughs> if that's what he saw, he would have said zitzis, but he didn't say zitzis. Anyway, uh, God would reign from Zion, Zechariah 14, 4 to 9. Who would like to read some for us? Well, maybe we don't need to read all of it. Uh, maybe not all of it. Let me read 8 and 9. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea, and the other half to the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And in that day, the Lord will be one, and his name will be one. So it's relevant to... God reigning in Jerusalem. This is, this is the millennial kingdom when the waters from Jerusalem will flow into the Dead Sea and also into the Western Sea as well, which is the Mediterranean Sea. That's pretty amazing when you stop and think about it. That has to be a tremendous source of water. That's, if that's going to happen, there has to be a tremendous source of water uh, under, under, under subterranean, uh, you know, a source of water, and one of those does exist. One of those do exist, I should say, underneath Jerusalem, only discovered about 40 years ago. Massive source of subterranean water. It's a river. They're referring to it, underground river, under Jerusalem. Now, right under the Kidron Valley, literally under the Kidron Valley, there's a tremendous underground river, and they say the source of it is ultimately Mount Kilimanjaro. Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, the Victoria Falls. But it's an underground source. It, it connects Asia, Europe, and Africa. Now, 
The Bible talks about in, in Zechariah here, there's an earthquake. Once the earthquake occurs, the Kidron Valley will split east to west, which is absolutely contrary to the fault line that goes north to south. So there's a fault line right above that underground river. That's the Kidron Valley. That fault goes from Africa into, into uh, Asia, and then Europe is connected there as well. So when Jesus comes, he puts his foot on the Mount of Olives. The valley splits that way to the west. And water that comes up from the valley goes to the Dead Sea and goes to the Mediterranean Sea. The source of water must be immense for that to happen, and it is. So Jerusalem will be completely refigured, redesigned when Jesus comes. There will be a water source coming from Jerusalem that will feed the Dead Sea and feed the Mediterranean Sea as well, which is amazing, right? So one of the reasons why we love Gan Aragut, Male Emos, where Ari and Jeremy is, one of the reasons we love that, that project is, who, who remembers? One of the reasons that we support them. Right behind the mountaintop down in that valley is the ancient river source that goes from the Kidron Valley into the Dead Sea. There's several of them, but this is, the, this is the most distinct. You can literally get down in that valley and follow it to the Dead Sea and back up. The valley actually goes into En Gedi. So En Gedi, of course where David hid, is a water source that filters into the Dead Sea. It's a fresh water source that filters into the Dead Sea. But when Jesus comes, that water source is going to expand tremendously. The source is going to be Jerusalem. It's going to cut down in that valley, come across uh, into the Judean wilderness, and round the backside of Gan Aragut. It's going to make a curve and head towards the Dead Sea. So we like that spot. We're invested into that spot. <laughs> We're invested in there, and we're going, to, we're going to invest some more into it because when Messiah comes, we'll be able to walk over there. It's about a four or five mile walk, hike. We'll be able to hike on over there and stand on that mountain and behold that water of life that will feed the Dead Sea and bring life to the Dead Sea. That's what it does, right? Uh, Ezekiel, you read those chapters in Ezekiel, the cha uh, chapter 40, 45 or something in Ezekiel, you see it. That source of water becomes a source of living waters that returns life to the Dead Sea. Fishermen will be fishing on the side of the Dead Sea because of that water that comes from Jerusalem. So this is, this is huge, right? So it's, it goes beyond just God's glory in Zion. So let's talk about the great king. Zechariah saw in Zechariah chapter 3. That, well, in fact, God spoke to Zechariah concerning some men. Read, read for us someone, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. Mm -hmm. Who's the branch? Jesus, Yeshua, is the branch. Zemach. He's not only... Zemach is one of the words in Hebrew for branch. The other word for branch is Natsur. And they both apply to Jesus. In fact, the angel that spoke to Mary said, he will be called Hanatsra, the branch. In, in Isaiah chapter 11, he's referred to as the Natsra, Hanatsra, and the Zemach. They're both, when you look at it, actually, the Zemach, the word Zemach for branch is actually an offshoot. So if you cut down an oak tree and you let it sit there long enough, it's going to provide a Zemach. Because the tree wants to live. It has a root system, it's going to provide a Zemach. But that Zemach can become a branch which is Natsur, branch. Zemach is also known as branch. So this is the Zemach Institute. It can also be called the Natsra, Ha Natsra Institute. 
All right, so this man, the branch, will come. He prophesy, he, Zechariah, Zechariah will to prophesy to Yehoshua, Yeshua, the high priest, and to his, and his friends, that they are but a symbol, a foretype, an archetype of the branch that is to come. Now let's go further on in Zechariah chapter 6. I'm going to read in Zechariah chapter 6 now. Now keep that prophecy in mind, the prophecy that went to Yeshua, the high priest. And here's the prophecy that's going to make it so crystal clear for us. I'm going to read 9 to, uh, 9 to 13. The word of the Lord also came to me saying, Take an offering from the exiles, from Heldei, from Tobiah, from Jedediah, from Jediah, Jediah, and you go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, where they, where they have arrived from Babylon. These are the men that came from Babylon. Take silver and gold, make an ornate crown, and set it on the head of Yeshua, the son of Zedokat. We talk about the Zedokite priests, the high priest. Then say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is the branch, the Zemach, Natsur, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build <coughs> the temple of the Lord, and he will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. Now those verses are packed with preachable material, incredibly profound material in there. So, two offices. He will be a priest. Yeshua, Joshua, this high priest, is a high priest with a crown on his head. Think about that for a moment. A high priest with a crown on his head, and it was a symbol of Yeshua, who would be the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. What does the word Melchizedek mean? A righteous king, a king and priest. So you see how profound this is, right? So this is, this is such a clear picture of the great king. The great king will be a priest on his throne. The offices are prophet, priest, and king. Those are, they all, he it already mentioned that he was a priest. The other two offices, prophet and king. So the branch will be, will be all prophet, priest, and king. That's, that's, what, that's what God wanted to communicate to the people of Israel, to Zechariah and his friends. Remember what he said about Joshua the high priest. He's a symbol of the branch. I'm going to make him a symbol of the branch, put a crown on his head, because he is a type of the great high priest, Yeshua himself. But listen to me. It is he that will build the temple. What is he referring to? Yes, it repeats again. It is he who will build the temple. Whenever God repeats himself, what does that tell us? He wants us to hear him. Listen to me. It is he that will build the temple. Yes, affirmative. It is he that will build the temple. So think about it. Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, they're already building the temple, the second temple. But here comes Zechariah in the power of the Holy Spirit saying, no, the branch, it is he that will build the temple. The branch is Yeshua. He is the actual builder of the temple. What temple? Well, the third temple. The living temple. Jesus said, if I go, I go to prepare a place for you. He is the builder of the temple. That's kind of redundant, right? Well, this goes back, this goes back to the promise that God gave to King David, that his son will be the builder of the temple. Right? Remember that? We studied this in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Very, care, very clearly, God said that you will not build the house, the temple, but your son after you, he will build the temple. Then God goes on to say in 2 Samuel chapter 7, I will build you a temple. But he already said that your son will build the temple. So you see, God is saying very clearly that, that your son, the son of David, the Ben David, 
who is Messiah. He is the one, but I am the one that's going to build it. So Jesus, Yeshua, is the one building the temple. He's carrying out this work on behalf of God, the place where God will dwell among men for a thousand years. You are the building, you are the building blocks in that living temple that Yeshua is building. It puts a whole new perspective, perspective on dying and going to heaven, doesn't it? Doesn't it? You're going to be, well, when, when I pass, I'm instantly a living stone in that temple that Yeshua is now building. And that's where I'll be. Yes? Is that the Nehos? The Nehos, yeah. The Nehos. The, Nehos. Mm -hmm. the living temple, the church is, there are a couple of words in Greek for temple. Not so with, with Hebrew. But with, in Greek, you got a couple of words. Heron, not guttural, Heron and Nehos. Heron, every time you see it in the Greek, it's referring to a physical structure, a temple. Nehos, on the other hand, is always referring to the church, which is the living temple. All right, so Paul in Ephesians. Let's go across to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to read 19 to 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Messiah Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing in a holy temple into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being fitted together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. This is the church. This is the Nehos. This is what Jesus is building. In February, actually March of 1991, I, I walked into this building for the first time. It was a Shabbat service. I came to it. Came very early because I was nervous. I didn't know, hey, I'm going to church, me. I'm going to church. So I came real early. I was the first person in. Pastor Ken was here. And he was straightening up the table, getting things in order for the service. And I walked in, I introduced myself and so on. I stood here for about 15 minutes before the first person showed up. I came real early. And I stood there and over and over during that first service here at the church, in this building, I was so convinced that I was called to be here incredibly supernatural set of events I began to experience after being born again. I was, in, in January of that year, I was born again. I had a profound, impactful moment of being filled with God's Holy Spirit, and I was born again. I came here a few months later, and the Holy Spirit confirmed to me without any hesit hesitancy that this is where I have prepared you to be. And lo and behold, I entered into about two and a half, three years of embattlement to be here, to stand here. Real, real fight. I see it happen with people. So many times people come in and there's an instant fight, a battle for them to be here. The battle is from within. It's also from without because suddenly people are opposing them for no apparent reason. <laughs> I just, it's not no apparent reason. Whenever I see it, it's apparent that that person is meant to be here and that spirit in you is confronting them. Not good when I see it. I don't like it. So, so I, I, had a, I had a tough time to stand here, but I knew without any question that I was called and appointed to be here. And there was a battle. <laughs> it was a dogfight in some cases for me to be here. Most of the battle was within me and some of it was from without. But the thing that was abundantly clear to me is that God had appointed me here. Well, that's Jesus building the temple. I was a stone that had to fit in to this temple with the other stones, and he brought me here in. And every time I said, you know, I, I left here one Shabbat, and I said, that's it. 
I am so gone from this place. Thank you for the experience of God, but I'm not coming again. I'm gone. And I, I convinced myself that I was free to go. So I went home and got up the next morning, went to work, and I, I'm sitting there eating my sandwich at work. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you will go tomorrow. <laughs> and all the other times I resisted, God was saying, no, nope, you're a stone. You're not fitting in really well. But I'm going to knock a little bit off here and knock a little bit off there and make it so that you will fit in. And the knocking off process is going to be painful. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit was con con convicting me strongly that the problem is not the space, that I, the, the fitting that I have for you. The problem is you're not ready. You're not shaped to fit into the space that I have for you. And the process is going to be difficult. It was difficult. Two and a half years of it. And finally, I became that stone that was well worked to fit into that space. Boom, there am I. And that's the temple. That's the temple that Jesus is building. Every church around the world is one aspect of that temple. On the day of his coming, all of these lesser temples will join together and become the ultimate temple, the ultimate church in Jerusalem. People talk about the body of Christ being a universal church. Well, there is truth to that, but the body of Christ will never be manifest until Jesus comes in a universal sense. The body of Christ exists here at Fellowship Church. The body of Christ exists across at the other church. And at the other church over there, the body of Christ exists to the extent that they are walking in that dimension of, of reality, of the being the body of Christ. But on the day of his coming, all of these bodies that have existed throughout time will resurrect and he will assemble them and place us on that mountain. And that's, the, that's the temple. It is he that will build. Yes, it is he that will build the temple. Of course, Zechariah didn't understand that it was not referring to Zerubbabel and this Joshua. He was a symbol of something that will happen in the future. All right, so let's talk about universal judgment. We talked a lot about this. Uh, Haggai talked about the shaking of the nations, right? Someone read for us in Haggai chapter 2, if you would please, 6 to 7. This is very interesting. Haggai chapter 2, 6 to 7. Wow. You know, the writer of the book of Hebrews, when he talked about in the end times, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. He was quoting from Haggai. He was literally quoting Haggai. So we think, all right, everything that, have, that, that will be shaken, can be shaken, will be shaken. So what, excuse me, what comes to mind when we, think, when we think about that verse in the book of Hebrews? Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Earthquakes. Earthquakes. Faith, nations, yeah. Well, that's what it is. God's going to shake the nations. What falls from that tree is going to be taken to Jerusalem. So the shaking of the nations is for the benefit of Israel, according to, according to Haggai. Right? See that? That's pretty incredible. So the judgment that's coming upon the nations, the shaking of the nations, is for the benefit of Israel. That's one of the themes that we've talked about over and over in the prophets. That when God turns his face away from Israel for the sake of judgment. So, strictly speaking, the period of time of Israel's chastisement comes all the way up to 1948. From 1948 onwards, we begin to see God's turning his face away from Israel for the sake of judgment chastisement, and then he turned his face towards the nations. The time of the Gentiles were fulfilled, 19, June 6, 1967. So, 
this is where we are right now. God is now shaking the nations and the gleaming, what he gleams from the nations, he's going to give to Israel. It's going to be a part of his, <coughs> his restoration process. That's what, that's what Haggai is talking about. Also, uh, in Haggai chapter 2, also 21 and 22. Someone else, if you would. Uh, Haggai chapter 2, 21 and 22. So, shaking of the nations. God's going to, Haggai speaks of that time when God will in fact judge the nations. Now, Zechariah had quite a bit to put emphasis on in this regard. So, in Zechariah chapter 12, I'll read uh, three, 2 and 3. I'll read 1 to 3. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reelings to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. This is that, this is that great battle that we know as Armageddon. Zechariah chapter, uh, same chapter, yep. Mm, yeah, uh, let's read verse 9. In that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Also in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 11. Is that correct? Could not be. No. Yeah, no. 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 Zechariah chapter 11, actually, verse 8. No? Uh, yeah, kind of. Mm. How much of this do I really want to read? I can read the whole thing. It's relevant. Chapter, chapter 14, verse 3, for instance, the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights against a man in the day of battle. Right? So God's going to engage the nations. Zechariah, uh, well, I don't think we need to read on too much. Um, all right, so also now let's talk about the new creation. So we've spent a lot of time looking at universal judgment. We know it's coming. The new, the new creation. Now, these prophets, Zechariah, Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi, did not put any emphasis on the new creation. But Zechariah did point quite a bit to the millennial kingdom, quite a bit. Uh, particularly in Zechariah chapter 14. Much of what he talked about in Zechariah chapter 14 is about the millennial kingdom, right? So, the millennial kingdom is not the new creation, but the, the, but the millennial kingdom is a foretaste or type of the new Jerusalem. Right? Jesus will reign in the earth during the, new, during the uh, millennial kingdom, and he will be uh, as God in the earth. To see him at that time, just as, just as it was when he first came, would be to see God. The only difference between when he first came... And when he will return, he will return in full glory with his bride, who will also be in full glory. And he will reign in Jerusalem, and, he'll be, and he and us will create the conditions under which we will represent a taste of the new creation. We will reign in new creation bodies. Humanity will be able to behold what they will inherit during the new creation. So we will be stationed in Jerusalem and, and definitely functioning throughout the world during the millennial kingdom in this new creation form. And, and then the people of the nations will be able to say, that is what I will inherit 
should I walk in the righteous path? That is what awaits me. That, that will be one of the aspects of the new creation. We won't, we, we, won't, we won't only be able to minister in that way, simply because of who we are, but we would be able to minister the Word of God as well. Literally minister the Word of God to and among the nations. <coughs> Excuse me. So now Zechariah, concerning the millennial kingdom, chapter 14, verse 11, people will live in it. Not the new creation, the millennial kingdom. People will live in it, and there will no longer be a curse, for Jerusalem will dwell securely. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 8 as well. And in that day, living waters, waters will flow, flow out of Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea, the other half towards the western sea. We read this just now. And the Lord will be king over all the earth, and in that day the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. So this is what it would be like during the millennial kingdom. It also says in the same chapter, verse 16, and it will come about after that any who are left of all the nations that went up against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the feast of booths, tabernacles. So during the Millennial Kingdom, every year there will be a special Sukkot celebration in Jerusalem, Feast of Booths, and the nations are mandated to come up and celebrate in Jerusalem. It goes on to say in verse 17 that any nation that does not, God's judgment will be upon them. How do we feel about that? Whoa, wait a minute. Jesus is going to bring judgment <laughs> during the millennial kingdom to any nation that resists God's festivals. That's what it's saying. The festival of Sukkot, if you say no, you're going to acquire God's judgment. How do we feel about that? <laughs> well, you, you, see what, you see what I'm referring to here? that the millennial kingdom is a literal kingdom with a king, a sovereign king, who will reign in the earth, who expects his constituents, the people of his kingdom, to walk in an orderly way before him. That's a different perspective of Jesus, the great king, but he is a great king that will... Listen, the whole point is to say this. Jesus will reign for a thousand years in a fallen creation as king. Even though it's the millennial kingdom, it's still a fallen creation. Still subject to all of the effects of the fall, very much so, and he's going to reign as a sovereign king right squarely in the midst of it. So if you're a sovereign king reigning in a fallen community, a fallen world, there's going to have to be what? <clears throat> So you are a judge, and you understand how that works. They are going to have to be a rule over that people. A rule. And that king will rule. He will rule the people of the earth. The book of Revelation is clear that those who overcome will rule with him with a rod of iron to rule over the nations. Very clear. So how does that apply to me and you, literally speaking? How will that apply to me and you? We're priests. What did the priests in Israel do? They had effectively four responsibilities, which was one, to administer the word of God, to administer healing, temple duties, and to marshal the community. Those were the four responsibilities of the priests, the Kohanim. <coughs> now, we are priests. We will be priests. So those four responsibilities are applicable to us. So we will marshal the community on behalf of the king. So let's say after the destruction that Armageddon brings, there's still a community here in, in, in let's say, in central Florida. Let's just say hypothetically that after this, this great judgment that's coming upon humanity, there's a community of 100,000 people in central Florida. 
And the first 100 years, everything's orderly, everything's fine. You know, 600 years into the, into the millennial reign, suddenly the community here that started off at 100,000 is now 6 million. And then they begin to do things such as eat alligators. They remembered when their ancestors used to eat those big, fat, juicy gators from Lake Jessup. And suddenly they're transgressing against God's law and they're eating these animals. Well, of course, Jesus, the great king, is aware of it and he sends a committee of priests over to deal with it. So he looks for those in his, in his temple who are from Florida, who can relate. So he chooses Doug and Lisa and, and Marion, and he commissions them to go over to Florida and look into this matter. We have, to, we have to correct this. Leave the gators alone. Let them live. They're unclean. Let them live. And so you guys show up here, and, and how do you show up? Boom, you're in Florida. He commissions you in Jerusalem. You're here. New creation bodies, <clears throat> glowing in God's presence. The Floridians here, the six million of them, they know exactly who you are. They know that Jesus has dropped the gauntlet. And so you show up, you show up, and you call, you call a meeting. You already know who's responsible. <laughs> the leadership of this community has allowed it. Should not have happened. But you, you, you're, you're sifting through the community. You're, you're judging, right? You're ruling in the community. You're going through, you're, you're, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do. Ultimately, you hold the responsible, the those who are responsible guilty. You bring them in and you say, all right, this is going to stop. The king is aware of it. He's been aware of it. He's been giving you a time to repent. That voice you kept hearing in your head, that was the Holy Spirit. That was God's Spirit speaking to you. You ignored it. Now the king has intervened. He has sent us. You're going to stop. Leave the gators alone. Let them live. You got farm animals, eat the farm animals. And they would say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, yes, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. And boom, you're back in Jerusalem. That's the kind of thing that hypothetically we'll be doing. Marshal in the community, serving the king in a capacity that we don't typically think of. But we're talking about a literal kingdom in a fallen world with a sovereign God king, with a people who are, who are also an aspect of who God is. God's going to be seen in you. So the six million people here, boom, you guys show up. Where do you show up? Right in the middle of the Castleberry. Right? So you showed up where? Well, right here at Fellowship Church, which is real close to, to Lake Jessup. You know this area. So boom, you showed up right here. You remembered when we had classes here and you worship here. Boom. The three of you show up here. Like, like Star Trek, you beam, you beam down. And you show up. Well, instantly, the community surrounding this area is aware that God has showed up. Representatives of the great king, who is representing the king of heaven, well, they have showed up. So from the, from the perspective of the community, God is here. The three of you show up, and you're representing God, and you have the power of God. Every bit of his power vested in you. And you have the power to judge. And as a judge... Let's say, let's say Doug, Lisa, and, and Marion calls in the guilty party, and the guilty party begins to lie. What, is, what does that mean? That they don't respect God at all. They don't respect that God is all-knowing, and that you're here fully aware of what's going on. And they begin to blame others and resist the judgment. What, 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 what would you do? Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and, and how it didn't go well for Israel. All right, so you'd issue a warning, a deterrent. Yeah. Because you're judges. You're here to judge. And you, you have the power. This is a tough one to deal with. But you have the power to execute punishment if you're a judge. And that's what the millennial kingdom is going to be. Now, I venture to say that by and large, people will not eat gators. Right? By and large, people will not transgress. Because the law will go forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. People will obey the law up to a certain point. Because we know what happens at the end of the millennial kingdom, right? 
massive insurrection, a final rebellion, Gog and Magog. But the king, the sovereign God king, is going to reign in a fallen community for a thousand years, and you'll reign with him. <laughs> that sounds so foreign, right? So out there. But it's actually the truth. Yes. Um, okay, so I thought we just heard well, Israel, Israel are not going to be the constables. Remember that in ancient Israel, only the priests were appointed to that position. Right? And so we are the priesthood. We are the Kohanim. If there's an issue that concerns us, we go out and deal with it. Whether it's to proclaim the word of God, temple duty, healing, right? The, the priests were responsible for healing or marshal in the community. Okay, folks.